it's ironic <clears throat> that I'm about to preach a sermon on healing <laughs> when I have been praying all week to be healed. Alas, but this morning in my prayers when I realized that this was the best voice you're going to get, it came to me that people who have offered to sub and do some parts of worship that I was going to do were part of a healing. And when y'all shouted, hallelujah, so loud in response to my meager assurance of pardon, it reminded me that I come into your midst and I can ask for your patience. And that is a form of healing and I'm grateful. So I'll do the best I can. How many of you all save money through Groupon or CJ Online daily deals? Are you a Craigslist or an Angie's List fanatic? We all love bargains. And two for the price of one store ads certainly get our attention. In Mark 5, 21 to 43 that John just read for us, Jesus offers a two for one healing deal. First, Jairus, the synagogue leader, a powerful position of status in Jesus' day, runs to Jesus, falls to his knees, amazing, and begs Jesus unfathomable to heal his critically ill 12-year-old daughter. As Jesus, Jairus, and the crowd head toward Jairus' home, Jesus' journey is interrupted when a woman who's been bleeding for 12 years touches the hem of Jesus' robe and is healed. Jesus' healing power flows out from him to stop her flow of blood. Jesus asks of the crowd, who touched my robe? Typical of how gospel writer Mark portrays the gospels, the disciples, often clueless. They ask Jesus incredulously, what do you mean who touched you? We're in a crowd with lots of people jostling you. Lots of people have touched you. But Jesus persists. The woman, realizing she's the one that Jesus seeks, comes forward trembling and like Jairus she kneels before Jesus. She tells him the truth of her life. It's a truth of trying doctors after doctors and trying to find healing and trying all her medical options, paying all her HMOs and co-pays that use up all her medical insurance and impoverish her becoming isolated from her community because of the uncleanliness of her hemorrhage. And after 12 years, her desperation. It's a truth of believing that Jesus can heal her. It's a truth of taking a risk of faith. And Jesus responds, Daughter, you took a risk of faith and now you're healed and whole. Live well. <clears throat> Live blessed. Be healed of your plague. Jesus then goes on to Jairus' house where the family and disciples dismiss him with disbelief and grief for the daughter has died. 
Jesus goes to her room, takes her hands, and lifts her up. You hear the resurrection foreshadowing. And he gives her this earthly, practical command. Feed this child. These two, for the price of one, healing stories lead us to ask, what are the magical words for healing? What is the right belief to receive healing? What must we do to be healed? How do we effectively pray for healing? I'd like to know. <laughs> Important as these questions are, they focus back on ourselves. So instead, I want to wonder aloud about what we learn about Jesus in these healings. Jesus makes himself available to all. Both Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, the as well as the unnamed desperate woman shoving through the crowd in the socially unacceptable status of being both unclean and being without a male escort. And children not yet considered persons in their own right get Jesus' attention. Rich, poor, powerful, powerless, asking for healing, receiving healing without asking, chronic illness, sudden death, no matter, coming into contact, being touched by Jesus, they're transformed from death to life. And even more amazing, Jesus interrupts his response to a frantic Jairus to insist on a face-to-face -face encounter with the unnamed woman, face-to-face -face touch of recognition for who she is. Jesus receives our deepest fears, our deepest hurts, even if we turn to him as our last resort. Consider that Jairus is healed too. In loving his daughter so much, he abandons his position and his sense of pride and makes himself vulnerable to Jesus, who alone could respond to his deepest need. Admitting our fear of illness or of death leaves us feeling vulnerable and exposed. But in desperation, we might be willing to try something different discover the courage to act differently. Is Jesus your last resort after trying doctors and friends' advice or Wikipedia? Jesus is an embodied healer a real man with real hands who can touch and reach out our very real hands. Jesus doesn't heal from a distance. Jesus doesn't spout the philosophy of healing. Jesus is present in the intimacy of touch. Notice all the details that gospel writer Mark provides in these verses. Jairus falls down at Jesus' feet. The crowd presses against Jesus. The woman grabs his robe and also falls down in front of him. Jesus takes the little girl's hands, insists that she be fed. And the ultimate
ultimate touch. Jesus tells us to drink his blood, the blood of life. The healing life that Jesus gives is our creaturely life, the life of the blood circulating through our bodies. The healing life that Jesus gives is also the truth telling that exposes to the light whatever blocks our healing. When Jesus' gift of healing is not an end to disease or illness, it's time to look for our wholeness, our well-being in both the kin, dumb, K-I-N, our need to be vulnerable, open, and truthful about our need within our family of faith, our kingdom, as well as the kingdom of God, where we will be face to face with Jesus. For Jesus, healing is about touching and allowing ourselves to be touched. Therein lies our being able to receive and give wholeness, well-being, shalom that permeates our whole being in this life and beyond. Through touch, we are healed and we are called to be healers through our own power of touch. This is the true twofer. Now let us listen to Anne Weems, a poet whose young adult son was murdered. Perhaps the poem Touch in Church is one way Anne, too, seeks healing for herself. Touch in Church. What is all this touching in church? It used to be a person could come to church and sit in the pew and not be bothered by all this friendliness and certainly not by touching. I used to come to church and leave untouched. Now I have to be nervous about what's expected of me. I have to worry about responding to the person sitting next to me. Oh, I, I wish it could be the way that it used to be. I could just ask the person next to me, how are you? And the person could answer, oh, just fine. And we both go home, strangers who have known each other for 20 years. <laughs> but now, the minister asks us to look at each other, and I'm worried about that hurt look I saw in that woman's eyes. And now I'm concerned because when the minister asked us to pass the peace, the man next to me held my hand so tightly I wondered if he had been touched in years. <laughs> now I'm upset because the lady next to me cried and, and then apologized and said it was because I was so kind and that she needed a friend right now. Now I have to get involved. Now I have to suffer when this community suffers. Now I have to be more than a person coming to observe a service. That man last week told me I'd never know how much I'd touched his life. And all I did was smile and tell him that I understood what it was like to be lonely. Lord, I'm not big enough to touch and be touched. The stretching scares me. What if I disappoint somebody? What if I'm too pushy? What if I, I cling too much? What if somebody ignores me? Pass the peace. The peace of God be with you and with you. And mean it. Lord, I can't resist meaning it. I am touched by it. I'm enveloped by it. I find I do care about that person sitting next to me. I find that I am involved and I am scared. Oh Lord, be here beside me. You touch me, Lord, so that I can touch and be touched, so that I can care and be cared for.
so that I can share my life with all those others that belong to you. All this touching in church, Lord, it's changing me. Amen.